Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to May's webinar. The topic for this month is corporate structuring, financing, and tax planning into China. Before we begin today's broadcast, I would just like to check that everybody can hear me accordingly. So if you could raise your hand just to let me know that the system is working, that would be great. In addition to that, just so everybody knows, I will be distributing the webinar presentation to you all after this webinar. If you do have any questions, please do put them into the questions section of the panel and I will send, um, I will reply to your questions uh, afterwards directly by email. For those of you that are new to Clayco Group's webinars, I would like to briefly introduce who we are. Clayco Group is an international accounting and management consulting firm that is headquartered from Hong Kong. It was established in 1979 by Mr. Klaus Kohler. It's grown since then to having over 120 consultants, accountants, and legal professionals based throughout its 10 offices in Asia, Hong Kong being the headquarters and eight offices in China and an additional office in Singapore. We assist clients in their market entry strategies into China, um, uh, offering a variety of outsourcing solutions to them. A little bit about myself. My name is Christina Kohler. I'm a director of Clayco Group. I am uh, in charge of our China offices and have been based in our Shanghai office since 2003. I've assisted numerous clients on their business transactions in China, whether it being setting up entities, restructuring entities, handling complex M&A deals, um, as well as all financing matters. I'm also co-author of Clayco's monthly magazine, which is entitled China Invest. Dot biz, which can be found on our website. So to start off today's presentation, um, which is corporate structuring, financing, and tax planning, I'm starting with questions that I usually recommend my clients to ask themselves before entering the China market. Um, these questions generally will assist somebody in understanding what type of corporate structure they require. So. The first is, what am I actually going to be doing in Asia? What is my business strategy? Am I sourcing? Am I doing sales? Am I doing service? Am I doing a combination of these activities as well? The next is, why am I really going to Asia? Um, a lot of our clients, after some initial discussions, realize that with the minimal amount of business that they're doing in Asia, it doesn't really require a corporate structure straight away. It's something that they can develop over time. Uh, many of them haven't even done market research uh, in terms of if they're sourcing in terms of suppliers in the area, if they are providing sales in terms of customers in the area. So really the idea is from questions one and two, what am I going to be doing in Asia? Why am I going to Asia? This is really your first market entry point. And without these type of questions answered, from the beginning, it's very difficult to understand as an advisor what type of corporate structure one should have. So whenever we meet with clients, this is usually our, always our first step in understanding what does a company want to do, what is their goal, both short and long term, and then understanding um, what their strategy will be. The third is where is my business in Asia going to be? And this really starts now getting into the nitty gritty of what should my corporate structure be? Um, many times we have clients who come to, to Shanghai for meetings and their focus has always been on China and when I ask them what is their five to ten year goal frame, what is their strategy for five to ten years time, it's not just China. It might also be other countries in the Asia Pacific Rim such as Australia, uh, Japan, Korea, and things like that. So when advising clients, it's very important to not only focus on what is the goal for the short-term strategy, which in my opinion is usually year one to year five, but it's also what is your long-term strategy after that five-year point when you're looking um, 
let's say, 10 years down the line, what you would actually like to be doing in the region. The fourth question is, when am I planning my entry? Now, um, this might be an Ill illogical question if you assume that a client is coming to us in Shanghai and saying we want to set up straight away. The thing is, it's that it's a very long decision-making process for a company if they're planning on investing in China. And um, if one is looking at, at Clayco's um, client pipeline, generally we see that it takes almost one year for a company to, to decide if they actually physically want to enter the China market. And as the laws and regulations in China are changing daily, of course you have to update your business plan regularly in order to be able to meet the needs of the laws and regulations that are occurring. Um, to give you an example, the e-commerce uh, laws and regulations are being updated um, very frequently at the moment because the government sees the need uh, to make these systems more transparent in order to aid foreign companies in doing their e-commerce in China. And these laws and regulations are not only about company law, but they're also associated with tax law and all the implications that are surrounding that. If one looks at Hong Kong as, a, as another example, there are double taxation agreements that are being signed monthly uh, in this jurisdiction. And as a result, it's also very important on a tax planning perspective to understand what the double taxation agreements uh, mean, uh, whether they exist, uh, and how they can impact your company if you're planning on being in Hong Kong. In Singapore, um, things are relatively stable. They have 62 double taxation agreements already, and as a consequence, there are a few upda fewer updates occurring in this region compared to the others. And lastly, who am I going to employ to manage my Asia business? Um, and again, this all relates to questions one and two, what and why am I planning um, to, to go to Asia? The questions are starting are you going to start with a distributor or agent? And in that case, you're not actually setting up a structure. You're outsourcing your business to a distributor or an agent um, to handle everything. Um, are you going to have a department responsible in your home jurisdiction to handle all the work that's involved with this new structure that you're planning in Asia? Or will you be seconding expatriates to Asia? And if you are seconding expatriates, where do these expatriates actually want to be? Are you allowing them to decide whether you should be based in Singapore, Hong Kong, China, or in other regions in Asia? Are you planning on localizing your business? Are you deciding from day one that you won't second expats, but actually you're going to be hiring local employees to make the business, let's say in China, very local by only having mainland Chinese people on staff? Or are you planning on mixing both cultures uh, in order to have both the Western influence and also maybe a local Asian influence in your office? These, again, are all questions that should be asked prior to getting involved in the corporate structuring because this will impact the laws and regulations that are associated with employing staff, seconding staff, uh, and in general just understanding if you are seconding staff, where do they want to be in Asia? Um, one of the biggest issues that we've seen is that if you are planning to set up an operational entity in Hong Kong or Singapore, that many expatriates prefer to go to Singapore, um, one, because of pollution issues. Uh, there's much less pollution in Singapore than in Hong Kong. But in addition to that, it's just um, from what we've seen, a general feeling that expatriates prefer to be in Singapore for the lifestyle um, and standard of living versus Hong Kong. So once these questions are answered and you have an understanding of what your business plan and what your business strategy in China is going to be, at that point you can decide what your investment and how you're going to start structuring your investments will take place. And the normal question that any company will actually ask is, is there a generic tax efficient holding structure for investment to China? Um, if I'm going into China and I'm planning on setting up an operational entity, do I need a holding entity in Hong Kong or in Singapore or perhaps even in Luxembourg or in Holland um, or in other jurisdictions to protect my interests in my home jurisdiction 
um, from the China business that I'm creating? And the answer is really yes and no. Um, the reason it's a yes, uh, sorry, the reason that it's no is because there are various factors that a, that a holding structure um, has as benefits. Um, as you can see here on the slide, you have to take quite a few things into consideration when you're planning on having a holding structure. What's the rate of withholding tax on dividends? Um, how will dividends be taxed in the country of my residence, i.e. my home jurisdiction? Uh, what is the tax position of the investee company? So, for example, if I'm setting up a holding entity in Hong Kong, what's the tax position of this Hong Kong entity? Um, what's the appropriate gearing level? What industry I'm, in, I'm involved in? And do I have any preferential treatments with this industry? And generally, what's the form of the investment that I'm making? Is it a corporate entity? Am I investing as, an, as, a, as a corporate entity or am I investing as an individual? Um, the, the answer can also be yes, however, if the focus is on the location of the investment holding company and a thorough tax planning uh, has occurred comparing all various jurisdictions. Um, one big mistake that our clients make when they come to us is that they assume that we are familiar and are tax experts globally, but unfortunately we're not. Our focus has always been on the three jurisdictions that we cater to, which is Hong Kong, Singapore, and China. But it's very important to understand what is your tax planning position and what tax benefits can you obtain by having a holding structure in your, compared to your home jurisdiction. So it's always very important to look all along a chain and understand what are your tax implications, if any, and what do I need to consider. So it comes to this, this actually comes to the next slide. What considerations do you have to make on the holding company level? Um, so obviously, you have to understand what are your taxes on dividends, and capital gains if you're planning on selling your, your structure. Um, you know, many of our clients, they initially say that they just want to enter the China market. When I then ask them, what is their goal in 10 years' time? They might say, well, actually, our goal is to add investors into the structure. Uh, we might even sell our investment to private equity firms uh, to raise funds it's much easier to sell a structure in Asia if you have a holding entity um, that's holding all the structures underneath it. Uh, it's very bureaucratic in China to sell an entity uh, than it is if you're selling it from a Hong Kong or Singapore perspective. You have to understand what is the withholding tax when the holding company pays dividends to its shareholders. You have to understand what is the impact for their sh these shareholders in their home jurisdiction. What is the effective corporate tax rate? So to give you a comparison, in Singapore it's 17%, Hong Kong it's 16.5%, and in China it's 25%. You have to understand what are the tax on distribution proceeds when the holding company is liquidated. Are there any stamp duty um, uh, implications? And for the holding company, is there a tax treaty network? This is extremely important because a lot of people assume that Hong Kong, for example, has an extensive tax treaty uh, network, which it doesn't. It's building currently this network. It has 27 double taxation agreements signed, but Singapore is much more mature in this way in that it has almost 62 uh, DTAs that are signed. Then you have to look at considerations on the China company level once you've decided that you're going to set up an entity in China. One of the biggest criteria from the State Administration of Taxation is that the holding company, if you decide to have one in Hong Kong or in Singapore or in other locations, has to have economic and commercial substance. And this is extremely important um, to, to take into consideration. China's substance requirements under both its domestic law and its tax treaties must be considered. China has stringent requirements that a non-resident must meet to qualify for the benefits under its tax treaties. So for example, between the DTA between Hong Kong and China, you have to show substance in your Hong Kong entity in order to be able to benefit from it. 
um, the recent guidance um, issued by the State Administration of Taxation emphasizes that shelf or conduit companies, basically shell companies, may not be used merely for the purpose of enjoying treaty benefits. The SAT, which is the State Administration of Taxation, has issued several circulars that contain detailed rules on the application and approval procedures and documentation requirements that apply to non-residents claiming benefits under China's tax treaties. For example, a major criterion of eligibility for the preferential tax rate on dividends under China's treaties is that the non-resident must be the beneficial owner of that income. And according to the SAT, the presence of the following factors, which I've listed on the slide, um, uh, indicates that a non-resident may not qualify as a beneficial owner. And as I said, I'll be forwarding you all of these slides so you can read it in more detail at a later stage. The SAT will really scrutinize both commercial and economic substance, and both the non-resident and the withholding tax agent in China are required uh, to meet disclosure requirements, for example, the identification of any direct or indirect shareholding in a Chinese company, description of the major business operations and projects, information regarding the number of employees, details of related party transactions, and so on. Um, really to demonstrate that the holding entity, the so-called holding entity, is not disqualified by any of the items listed here on the slide. So it's, it's really showing that it's not only home jurisdictions, for example, the US or Germany or France or Italy, that are scrutinizing the fact that a holding company in the Asia-Pacific Rim has to have substance. But it's also the fact that the Chinese government, if you are utilizing a holding entity to go into the market, is scrutinizing that this holding company has to have substance. How do you define substance? Now, every government bureau has different criteria and different uh, definitions of this. But the basic definition of substance is that there are employees employed in the entity. Usually, there are also local directors. Um, that are appointed within the structure and that there are physical transactions occurring, whether that is holding IP or whether it's physical trade transactions that are occurring throughout the entity. So the next item, once you've decided um, and you've understood what all the investment criteria are for holding, for setting up holding structures in terms of your corporate structuring, is that if you do decide you would like to have a holding structure, then you really need to look and compare. Um, I've listed here five, uh, sorry, six countries, um, which are usually typically the most looked at holding jurisdictions in the world. Um, Belgium, Hong Kong, Ireland, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Singapore. Um, you have to understand many people also opt not to set up Hong Kong or Singapore structures and rather set up Luxembourg entities to go right, right into China. Or they set up Luxembourg Hong Kong or Luxembourg Singapore or even Belgium Singapore um, to create these type of corporate structures. The four points one really has to look at are dividends, what are the implications, capital gains, what are the implications, direct transfer of shares, and indirect transfer of shares. So if you're looking at dividends and you're comparing all of these six jurisdictions, under the Chinese domestic law, a 10% tax is withheld, is withheld on dividends paid to a non-resident, so i.e. To the, to the holding entity. And most of China's tax treaties, with the exception of the treaties with Belgium and the Netherlands, reduce the withholding tax rate to 5% if the relevant shareholding and other requirements are met. So dividends tax in China, if you are um, utilizing Belgium and Netherlands, is at a rate of 10%. And if you're utilizing Hong Kong, Ireland, or Singapore, it's 5%. To make an additional note here, um, China and the UK are also creating a new double taxation agreement, which will come into fruition on January 1, 2014. And this will be another additional jurisdiction whereby the dividends tax will be lowered from 10 to 5%. Uh, so the UK will also fall under that category. 
When you're looking at capital gains, according to the profit tax law in China, a 10% withholding tax is levied on capital gains derived by a non-resident without a per permanent establish in China from the direct transfer of an equity interest in a Chinese entity. Um, if you're looking at direct transfer of shares, China's treaties with most of the other jurisdictions do not allow China to impose uh, a tax on capital gains arising on the transfer of a shareholding of less than 25% in a Chinese company, except in the case of the treaty with the Netherlands, which allows tax to be levied regardless of the percentage of the shareholding. Under the tax treaty with Ireland, China does not tax capital gains even when the relevant shareholding is more than 25%. And as noted, maintaining substance is paramount. The State Administration of Taxation has the authority to revoke, uh, to, to invoke the Chinese, the Chinese General Anti-Avoidance Provision for transactions whose really dominant objective is to avoid taxes. There have been instances in the past when a company has failed to attain the required level of substance, and the State, state Administration of Taxation has accordingly denied the tax treaty. So let me give you here an example. A Hong Kong company that disposed of a 20% shareholding of a Chinese company was held to not have met the below 25% shareholding requirement for the purpose of the capital gains tax exemption under the China-Hong Kong tax treaty because actually this Hong Kong company owned another 18% of the shareholding in the same Chinese company but through another Hong Kong entity. And what that means is, is that the State Administration of Taxation really looked into the background of the shareholders of this Chinese entity and discovered that the two Hong Kong holding structures were actually holding more than 25% in combination. And this is obviously then in violation of the Double Taxation Treaty. So the State Administration of Taxation are not just sitting back on their hind heels approving every single application that goes to their door. They are really investigating the shareholding structures. And this is why providing substance and understanding what occurs in these holding structures is very important. The indirect transfer of shares, um, this is a strategy that has been employed in the past to avoid capital gains taxation in China. Um, what it involves is utilizing an overseas holding company to invest in China and then exiting the investment by transferring the overseas holding company. So, for example, you might have a structure whereby you have a Hong Kong holding entity which holds a China entity. And you might have the investor decide, I'm going to sell the entire structure, so Hong Kong and China, to new investors versus just selling China. The jurisdiction of the holding company in these structures is typically either, ta um, typically either taxes capital gains at a low rate or does not tax them at all and has concluded a tax treaty with China that provides beneficial withholding tax rates. The State Administration of Taxation has challenged the treaty exemption of gains derived from these structures on the ground of lack of substance. To give you an example, um, the Chinese tax authorities held that capital gains arising from the transfer of shares of a Singaporean company that held equity in a Chongqing-based Chinese entity were capital gains arising from the disposal of the underlying Chinese company. As a result, the transaction was treated as a direct sale of the Chinese company by the parent of the Singaporean holding company and hence was subject to a 10% tax on the capital gains. The State Administration of Taxation took the position that the Singaporean company lacked economic substance because it did not engage in any other business activities except acting as a holding company for this Chinese entity. Uh, it had minimal capital, it had no employees, and there were no transactions running through this entity. And obviously the State Administration of Taxation perceived this, that they were merely um, they had this entity in Singapore merely for the purpose of avoiding capital gains tax. Practitioners in the industry have argued that most holding companies would not have substance because 
well, normally they do not have a significant amount of capital and they do not carry on business activities. In response, the State Administration of Taxation has agreed to centralize the application of the general anti-avoidance provision and to discourage transactions with the dominant objective of avoiding uh, capital gains tax through indirect transfer of shares, the SAT began using the substance over form principle, which states that one can disregard the existence of an in intermediary holding company if it lacks a business purpose and was established for their purpose of avoiding tax. So in this case, the foreign investor would be subject to Chinese withholding taxes on capital gains derived from the transfer. So as you can see, uh, with indirect transfer of shares, you really have to show substance in that holding entity in order to be able to benefit from the tax treaties. Uh, and it's very important to, um, to remember this. So what is the conclusion when you're looking at these six jurisdictions? What jurisdiction will actually be suitable? And there is no fixed answer to this. The answer can only be formulated once somebody looks at their own business model looks at what their short and long-term strategies are going to be, what their status in terms of seconding expatriates or having local staff, whether they're going to have transactions in the holding entity, yes or no, or whether it will just be a shell and that's it. One has to talk to tax advisors in their home jurisdiction to understand what the tax implications are, if it's a corporate structure or if you're investing as an individual. And one really has to look at the double taxation agreements between China and the holding, juris holding company jurisdictions as well. But I would like to sum up the table um, to give you an understanding of what, what our, um, uh, our, our summation is uh, and what we advise clients. Hong Kong generally does not tax offshore income and Singapore does not generally tax foreign source dividends foreign branch profits or foreign source service income in some cases. As a result, Hong Kong and Singapore also may not be the best holding company locations for the purposes of indirect transfer of Chinese investments. Um, because basically you're not paying taxes in these two jurisdictions, the Chinese authorities might perceive you as not having substance in these two jurisdictions, even though you might be um, having transactions that are actually occurring. Transaction cost considerations may also make Hong Kong, Singapore, and Ireland unattractive because all three jurisdictions would impose stamp duty on the transfer of shares. So you have to also look at the tax implications in these holding jurisdictions to understand whether there's any tax implications as well. Turning to other factors, um, it seems there could be tax leakage if the holding company is located in Belgium or Ireland because these jurisdictions impose a tax on dividends received. So you have to understand that the world is really becoming transparent, not only on the banking side, where it's very difficult to open now bank accounts um, for corporate entities if you're, if you're locating in offshore jurisdictions such as British Virgin Islands, Seychelles. As some of you may have noticed, I haven't included in my table of jurisdictions British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Mauritius, Seychelles, etc. for the main reason that early on in January of this year, the banks have um, uh, made internal policies that they will make it very difficult to open corporate bank accounts for offshore entities. As such, I've not included it here because it is really our opinion that companies should not be establishing offshore entities in order to structure their businesses in China. They should be looking at jurisdictions such as Hong Kong, Singapore, Luxembourg, Belgium, Netherlands, which are much more mature markets and are perceived by the banking world um, and the tax world as being better jurisdictions. Um, all the tax bureaus around the world are also starting to talk to each other. So there is tax leakage occurring um, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and this has to be understood. Although neither Hong Kong nor Singapore taxes capital gains, it is not uncommon for disputes with tax authorities to arise over what constitutes a capital gain as opposed to a revenue gain. So that's important about Hong Kong and Singapore. 
In the case of dividend distributions, some countries such as Belgium and Ireland impose withholding tax when dividends are distributed to non-treaty recipients. So once you have your dividends in Belgium and Ireland and you want to re repatriate that back to your home jurisdiction, you also have to see whether there are DTAs there that can, that can assist you or whether there are withholding taxes as well. The tax treaty network of the proposed holding company jurisdiction is also a factor that cannot be ignored. So in this respect, Belgium and Netherlands have the largest number of treaties, although both Luxembourg and Hong Kong are negotiating new treaties or tax arrangements um, to incorporate the OECD's exchange of information article. Singapore also has 62 treaties that are available. Um, so this is another area that, that one should, should consider. What are the trends that we see? So really in summation, um, here I wanted to, to really provide an understanding of what our clients are doing when they're entering the China market. The first is doing your research. Um, make sure when you're entering the China market, you've done your research, you understand that you want to be based there, that you actually want to do your business there. We are starting to have a lot of clients that are deciding not to work with third-party manufacturing uh, entities in China, but are rather looking to outsource these functions to suppliers in Vietnam, in Bangladesh, in Thailand, and other regions um, in the ASEAN. So do your research. Understand, do you really want to be in China? Do you want to put all your eggs in one basket? Or do you actually want to spread your supplier network throughout Asia Pacific? If you're looking on the sales side, generally speaking, China will not be ultimately your only market that you want to enter in Asia. You might also want to start selling in Australia, in Korea, in Japan, or not even in mature markets. You might want to start selling in immature markets or developing countries such as Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, etc. So do your research. Understand which markets you want to enter into, both in the short and in the long term. Tax planning. This is always forgotten. Nobody tends to do a proper tax planning strategy. Talk to your advisors in each link of your chain to understand what is most beneficial for your business. Um, if you are a U.S. entity, you have a bunch of options available to you in order to understand what structure you need in the U.S. to be able to benefit from tax treaties or just generally advising a proper tax planning strategy. Many of my clients, when they approach me, and I, I always openly ask them, have you done your tax planning? Have you spoken to your tax advisor in your home jurisdiction? Many of them say to me that they haven't, and that this is not really a concern for them, because initially when they're starting their business in Asia Pacific, they're not planning on making profit for the next five to ten years. But that's where your mistake lies. You have to make sure that you are prepared in advance and you have a proper structure in advance in order to be able to take advantage in five to ten years when you do start making profit to know that you have the most tax efficient and optimized structure that there is. Many of our, our clients that are focused on the ASEAN um, usually set up holding jurisdictions in Singapore um, to enter the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, generally, Hong Kong is used as a holding uh, jurisdiction if one is planning to enter the entire Asia-Pacific Rim or if they're just focusing on the East Asian countries, particularly China. Generally in China, everybody is establishing operational entities, whether it's manufacturing entities, trading entities, service entities. It really makes no sense in China to establish um, holding entities for your businesses in the Pacific Rim. The tax implications are just too high in that regard. So this is a general trend that we have seen um, in regards to, in regards to uh, businesses. One thing I would like to mention here, and I had mentioned, I mentioned it very briefly earlier on, is that um, many of our European and U.S. clients forget to also investigate whether they themselves need a holding jurisdiction to hold their Asia-Pacific um, business. And we've seen structures whereby U.S. and European entities have set up Luxembourg structures or even structures in, in, in the Netherlands or Belgium 
to hold their Asia Pacific business. Um, and again, this is for tax implications. When a uh, company is looking to repatriate dividends or even to repatriate licensing fees um, or royalty fees back to their home jurisdictions, sometimes it's much easier to do that and more tax efficient if you do have a holding structure in, for example, Luxembourg or the Netherlands. So this can always be in combination um, with the holding structures, structures that you may need then in Asia. And again, this is why it's so important to talk to your tax advisors back home um, as well as then in Asia to make sure that you have the right structures at hand. Um, I do want to provide a brief conclusion um, to our webinar today based on corporate structuring, financing, and tax planning. For direct investment into China, the most important factor is that the investor has sufficient commercial and economic substance to withstand any challenge by the Chinese tax authorities. A holding company making such an investment should not simply be a shelf or otherwise known as a conduit company or shell company if it is to enjoy the benefits of the China, China's tax treaties. If the requisite level of substance is present, a holding company can be located efficiently in Luxembourg, Hong Kong, or Singapore. If Ireland is utilized, which provides preferential exemptions for capital gains, um, and whether if this is used, then care really must be taken to ensure that no tax leakage will be suffered, because Ireland generally taxes dividend income. Um, Netherlands and Belgium may not be efficient locations for holding company because China imposes a 10% withholding tax on dividends um, paid to residents of those jurisdictions uh, rather than the 5% that applies in Luxembourg and Hong Kong or Singapore. For indirect investment into China, multinational groups with genuine merger and acquisition transactions uh, involving disposal of interests in Chinese companies could consider setting up a structure with at least two levels of holding companies. Uh, so as I mentioned, you could have a Luxembourg entity together with, let's say, a Hong Kong entity that's then investing in China. Given the changing international tax environment, as well as the banking environment, the ever-increasing Chinese regulatory requirements, it's no longer a simple task to set up a tax-efficient holding structure for Chinese investment. Thus, taxpayers are really advised to seek professional advice before the implementation of any structure, both from their own country, as well as the holding company jurisdiction, and of course, China. So I hope you've enjoyed today's webinar. I've hope, I hope that I've been able to clarify um, or understand what thought processes need to occur in order to understand what type of corporate structuring a company needs. In terms of financing, this is also one, one subject that needs to be focused on. If you do need financing, where can you obtain it from? Um, and then, of course, general tax planning has to occur. And uh, this has to occur, in my opinion, before you set up the corporate structures uh, so that you don't have to restructure at a later stage. So if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, our contact information is here. If, um, uh, if you do have any uh, questions in regards to your own business models, we'll be more than happy to assist you. Uh, and uh, I hope to see all of you in next month's webinar, um, which you can enroll on our website at clacogroup.com in the events section. So again, thank you very much for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you all soon again. Thank you, and goodbye.